Mr. Wheel, lead us in a word of prayer this morning. Good morning, Father. Thank you for another day on this earth. Thank you for bringing us all safely to your house of prayer so that we can worship and praise your holy name. Please be with all of our class members that are unable to be here today. And comfort them and take care of them. Now hold up all of the names on our prayer list and those that were brought up here today. And I, you know each and every one situation. Please heal them, comfort them, and save them. And thank you, Lord, for all of your grace and mercies, which are new every morning. And thank you for giving us faith. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe in the resurrection. And we believe that Jesus will return. And I look forward to hearing what you have to tell us through your servant, Larry, and later on through your servant, Jacob. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good, good to see you here. I was reminded, not in a prayer, but I was reminded of the fellow that went to a football game, and he was a football fan, and he climbed, he climbed, he climbed up the stadium seats till he got to the very top, and he looked down, and a crowd was beginning to come in, but he, he looked, and there was a fellow sitting uh, on the 50-yard line by himself, empty seat next to him. But he just makes his way down, goes down there and sits down by the man and says, is, uh, is this seat taken? He said, no, my wife and I have been coming to this same football game for 45 years. And uh, she's not here today. She passed away. He said, oh my goodness, isn't there anybody in the family that could have come with you today. I hate to take this seat. He said, no, they're all at the funeral. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was bad, wasn't it? That was bad. I don't even know why I told you that. <laughs> I guess it was to say I'm going to miss you when you're gone. <laughs> All right, let's turn to our Bibles to Exodus chapter 18. We're beginning a new session uh, dealing with uh, discipleship. You've heard that word before, haven't you? In, in our church, discipleship. But listen, when, when we talk about discipleship, let's remember one thing that will make it, I think, a little simpler. And that is this. Discipleship is no more than helping one another out. Helping one another out. We need it. We need each other, don't we? Uh, and investing in the lives of others. The, the older I get, the more I understand and appreciate uh, people that have invested into my life. And it's, it's meant tremendously uh, made a difference in my life. And so when we get the opportunity to invest in people, listen, what Jesus did while he was here on earth was he took and he invested his life into people. And he taught us to do the same thing. None of us can grow in the, in the way that we should grow as Christians without the help of others. We cannot do it. And I say that because the burden gets so, so large sometimes uh, and so heavy sometimes that, that we just can't do it without other people coming in and sharing the load. And that's what we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks is, is how do we help someone else 
invest in their lives and help them carry the load. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's meant for us to grow. Listen, we grow spiritually. When you think about it, we grow spiritually when we help others grow spiritually. You see it in Sunday school teachers, you see it in pastors, every one of us will tell you in a moment the way we stay close to God is we get in His Word and then we share that Word with someone else. And that's how, that's how it grows us spiritually and, and just encourages us spiritually. And that's what we're going to learn about in the next few weeks is in investing in people. You ever notice those people around that will never ask for help? You know, I happen to be married for one. <laughs> so two one, not for one, but two one. And she rarely, rarely would she ask for help. Uh, and then when I do help her, well, we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that. But anyway, I got to go eat after a while. <laughs> the best leaders are those leaders who can delegate, delegate responsibilities. And the best leaders are those who don't already know it all. Uh, and they're teachable. They have a teachable spirit. Listen, when we get to that point where we, we know everything or think we know everything, we have lost the ability to have a, a spirit that is teachable. And we need, we need to maintain that in our lives that we are people who will listen and let God speak to us through His Word and through other people and make a difference in our life. When we look at the Old Testament, we see that Moses is one of those central figures in the book of Exodus. He's a great leader. Uh, but Moses had that problem of taking and trying to do everything. And he was up against an impossible task. This guy got up every day facing over 3 million people that needed water, needed food, needed shelter, needed all those things. He woke up with that every, every single day. And so he needed help. He was up against an impossible job. And he, the more he worked at it, the more it wore him out more and more on him. And so he just, he needs help. So we see that in Exodus, and he's a main character in Exodus, a tremendous leader. But what I want you to notice too, every time, and, and I, I don't know if it's what it is about me, but I always try to find something when we're on a lesson that's in the Old Testament. I always try to pull it over to the New Testament and find well, where does it address the same problem in, in the New Testament? So if you, if you got your Bible real quick before we turn in uh, to Exodus 18 and get into the lesson, look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. And I'm going to read to you because he's going to be talking to, same, to some of the same people in both passages of Scripture in the Old Testament and here in the New. Mine is, is under the... the uh, Doesn't sound like it. Yeah, we got you. Okay, good. Okay, I'm to the elders, and he says, shepherd the flock. Shepherd the flock. You know what we need in churches today? We need more shepherds. We need more men who will come along and shepherd and help shepherd the flock. He says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. In verse 2 he says this, Shepherd the flock of God. Don't ever forget people that it's not our flock. It's not our church. It's not our Sunday school class. It's God's. And he's given us the privilege of shepherding that flock. The flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, and he's going to say, say the same thing over in Exodus, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to your care, 
but being examples to the flock. And then here's your reward and my reward for doing this. And when the chief shepherd comes, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Isn't that great? He moves that on from this Exodus experience that Moses is in the middle of. And he again talks to us, the church today, through the New Testament as well. So we're going to look at Jethro. It's not the NCIS guy, it's another guy. Jethro, the priest of Midian. We're going to look at Moses. How are they related? They're related by marriage, right? Jethro is Moses' father in law. Uh, and he's beginning, he's, he's, they're camped at the, the mountain of God. They're kind of close to where Jethro is. Moses has, has worked for Jethro, the father in law. Uh, and he has, uh, he has given it to Jethro's care, his wife and his two sons, while he's in Egypt. And he's going to bring the children of Israel out of uh, bondage. Been in bondage for many, many years, and he's going to lead them out. But he has given, and we don't really know why he did that. Uh, but he did, and he entrusted them into his father in law's care, and now he has, he has sent word to Moses that I'm coming to you, and he puts in there, I'm, and I'm bringing your two sons with you, and I'm bringing my daughter back to you. So he said, I've got something for you, Moses, that you left. And I don't know why he does it the way he does, but he, he beats him. And Moses goes out to meet his father-in-law. We're going to pick that up in verse 7 and read through verse, uh, uh, verse, uh, I, it, verse I think it's verse 8. It's just 7 and 8. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. So Moses... I love that because his father-in-law has sent word that he's coming to, to you and with your wife and your two sons. You can have them back. And Moses went out to meet him, his father-in-law. And what does he do in verse 7? How does he meet his father-in-law? Moses comes out. How does he meet him? He bows down before him as a means of respect. And the ultimate respect here is he, he gives him a kiss. He, he, he has a tremendous amount of respect for his father-in-law. And what all his father-in-law has done for him in the past. He spent many years with his father-in-law, working for his father-in-law. And he respected this man greatly enough to the fact that he left his two children and his wife for him to protect in that time period. So he bowed down to him. He, he, this is the way they would have met. Uh, and he, then he, they go into the tent. They talk to each other about their well-being. and get that out of the way. And then they move on to what? In verse 8. Or they move on to. Moses begins to share with his father-in-law what? The story of what happened to him. The story of what has happened on this journey that he has made. Look at verse 8. It says, Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh. I love the way he starts off this conversation with his father-in-law. Don't you? He begins that conversation by saying this, we would not be here today had it not been for the Lord. He says, I want you to know that we would not be here today if it was not for the Lord. I want you to know you wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the Lord. I wouldn't be here. None of us would be here was it not if it hadn't been for the Lord. And listen, I, I, I know you know this already, but I'll remind you, God did not free the, the, the Israelites because they were perfect and because, or because they were good people. He freed them out of His great love for them. He freed them because 
He loved them more than, than they could ever know. He loved us more than we could ever know. And that's the reason they're here. But he's, he's referring to him, uh, to, to his father-in-law there, of all the hardships that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord had continued to deliver them one time after another. Time after time again, the Lord stepped in and delivered them. Don't you love the fact that the Lord never stops delivering us? He never stops providing for us. He never stops in, in that, that time we need Him the most. He is there. I used to say, and, and the Lord shows up. No, He doesn't. He's already there. He's already there for us. He's delivering us time and time again. How the Lord had delivered it. Now, when Jethro hears this, how does he respond? He's listening to his son-in-law. His son-in-law is telling all the, And remember, he is a priest in Midian. We don't know really uh, the extent of that priesthood. But we do know that the Midianites were enemies of Israel. They were not defeated. They, they have problems with whether they fought the Amalekites right before this. And prevail. And the Amalekites were not destroyed until King David destroyed them later. But the Midianites began to be enemies to Israel. And again, he's the priest of Midian, and he has listened to, to Moses. And what does he do in verse 9? How does he how does he respond to what he's hearing? He rejoiced. He rejoiced. Listen, when we hear as God's people the goodness of God, the deliverance of God that we have experienced in our life, when we hear that, the natural response to that should be what? We should rejoice. We should rejoice. I see a lot of people today that I don't know how you would ever make them happy. I'm honest with you. I don't know how you would make them happy. Some people are just, they're just, they're just down all the time. But when Jethro hears how the Lord has delivered the children of Israel from bondage time and time again, he rejoices in that. We need to rejoice with people when they're rejoicing. We do. We need to be with, we need to be with them in that rejoicing. Listen, if we're going to be with people in their bad times, we're going to have to rejoice with people in their good times. And that's, that's one of our privileges. We rejoice and we find common ground where? In God. We find the common ground to rejoice in God. And so he, he rejoices. But look what else he does in verse 10. And Jethro did what? What did he do? Not only did he rejoice in what he was hearing, but what did he do? What does it say? And he blessed the Lord. He blessed the Lord. He rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done for Israel, that he had delivered them. And Jethro, in verse 10, said, he blessed the Lord. What did he do? He began to see. He began to worship God. He began to worship God. And this is amazing that what is happening here to Jethro, he's making this, this blessing. He's blessing God the Lord for his deliverance of, his, of the people of Israel. Verse 11 is a key verse. Read that for us, would you? Verse 11. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. What he does in verse 11 is, is kind of a confession, a profession of faith and a confession of now I know that the Lord is greater than all the other gods. That's a tremendous statement of faith coming from one who has come to know. And here's the thing, he had he now experienced God. In the past he had just heard what he had done, but he makes the trip and he begins to experience firsthand and he begins to, to know this God that he's rejoiced in and that he is blessed 
and he he begins to uh, confess and profess. And here's the profession. He is greater than all the other gods. He is God and God alone is what he said there. He translated that out. It, that's what he, Jethro is, is professing that God is above all gods. He is above all gods. And he says and he, has, he has behaved proudly. He, he was above them all. Then Jethro, brother Moses, father-in-law, took a burnt offering and offered sacrifices to, to Moses, his God, which has now become his God also. They came and they got all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses, father-in-law, before God. So you see this change in, in Jethro's life. He begins to put his faith and his trust in this God that now he has come to know. It's no longer hearsay. We have too many hearsay Christians in the church today. We have too many hearsay Christians in the church today. We need to be a people who knows their God. And that's what he's beginning to do. In verses 13, he goes with, his, I guess it's take your father-in-law to work day. And that's what he does. Look, read for us 13 through uh, I think it goes through 17, doesn't it? 18. 13 through 18. The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone, and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Isn't it amazing how we think we can do everything by ourselves sometimes? I used to get amazed at our kids when they were small. <clears throat> and they grew up and they're still that way. When you would try to do something for them. You know, I broke this toy for the 15th time. Would you see if you put the wheel in the back of it? By the time you get it in your hand, they grab it right out of your hand. And I'm, well, Dave, I will fix that for you if you'll let me have it for a while. I think that's the way God works in our lives sometimes. If you just give it to me and leave it there, I'll fix it for you. I'll work on it. I'll bring it. When I give it back to you, it'll be brand new. You know, that's the way it works. But isn't it amazing, too, how in life sometimes we need an outsider to come in and see a problem? Right off the bat. And that's how it happens, isn't it? We get so used to, to doing things the way we've always done them sometimes that it takes an outsider to come in and show us exactly how to fix a problem. And that's what Jethro does here. It doesn't take him long. The next day when he went out, he saw what Moses was doing. Can you imagine this scene when, when you look at it? He said, uh, uh, I came out the next day that Moses said to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses, how long? All day long. From early, early morning to late at night, or until evening, they stood there together, Moses setting and passing judgment on all these disputes, and the people waiting around. And it doesn't take Jethro long at all to see that what you are doing is what? It's not good. It's not, not only is it not good, it's not working, is it? Uh, and he, he tells him, he said, it, it's not a good thing, and you're going to wear yourself out first, and then what? While you're wearing yourself out in judgment of these people, these people are being worn out for what? Waiting around all day. Can you imagine them leaving? 
I've run into a little, little problem at, at the pharmacy that he tried to remind me of when I looked at this lesson this week. I will get a text on my phone. Your prescription is ready to pick up. It, you, have you been there? You go and you wait in line for 30, 40 minutes in line. And I'm trying to be a patient person, which is very hard for me to do. I wait in line, I wait in line, I wait in line, I wait in line. I finally get up there and told him, I said, I'm supposed to have two prescriptions ready. And I even pulled my cell phone out, which, and I said, see, I got a day for now. They're ready for me. I didn't know what they're going to cost me. You know their response? They start looking, looking, looking. They're, they're not ready. They're not ready yet. This is not working. Jeff Rose sees that it's not working. He said, you're going to wear yourself out. You're going to, and the people are going to be worn out because of that. And so I'm going to give you a solution to your problem. I love Moses' uh, reception, what he's hearing from his father. What does he tell him to do? Basically, what does he tell him? Delegate responsibility. I've always, I'm, I've always wondered, you know, do we, do we have um, what's going to come next? You know, what's going to come next? Do we plan ahead? Do we, do we plan ahead? I, I go to meetings after meetings in, in my work, and all I see is people my age or older in the business anymore. You wonder. How's, how's this going to work? I mean, we're not going to live forever. How's this going to work? Are we planning ahead or are we just living from day to day? And that's what, that's what Jethro was telling his, his son-in-law and sharing with him. He says, you need to have a different strategy. And that strategy is we need to divide this workload up. And look at the, look at the men that he's going to asked to do the job. In verse 19 through 21, you'll see it. He said, listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel and God will be with you. I love that, don't you? I'm going to give you counsel, but it's going to be godly counsel. It's going to be God's going to be with you. Stand before, stand before God so that you may bring the difficulties to God. I love the way Jethro puts this. He said, you're going to stand before God and you're going to bring these difficulties to God first. I'm going to fil filter everything that's going to go on here in this distribution of help in this manner. Everything is going to still come before God. Listen, in our lives we need everything that happens in our life to come before God. He should be our first contact. And that's what he said. He said, stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them. He said, your responsibility, Moses, is what? Teach the word. Teach the law. And make it into a practical way that they can observe that. Put it to use in their, in their life. Make it practical. And he does that. And he says, you do that. But then you select able men. And here's the qualifications for that. Such as do what? First one on the list. Fear God. God fearing men. Do we not need God fearing men? To step up. To step up. Take their place. God fearing men. Men of what? Oh, this is a big one in our day and age. Men of truth. Men of truth. It's a it's an odd commodity now. It's truth. Nobody wants to hear it. Everybody wants to make up their own version of it. But he says we need men of truth. Hating covetousness. Can't be bought out. Can't be bought out. And place such over them the rulers of thousands. And he, he tells him exactly how. It's amazing here to he, how he divides up the people. Said some are going to be, have a great responsibility.
possibility. Others might not have any, any more than 10. But everybody has a share of the load. I love that. Can, can you imagine if, if any church today put this into practice? What a difference it would make in our church. They were willing to share the load. So it will be easier for you and that they will bear the burden with you. That you may, they may bear the burden with you. If you do this, and God, as God so commands you, you will be able to endure. Endure. And all these people will also go to their place in peace. You're going to cause peace in the camp when you distribute the workload equally. We need to do that. Moses did that. He chose able men of all of Israel, made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds and fifty, rulers of ten. So they judged the people all the, at all the time. Hard cases they brought to who? They brought to Moses. But they judge every small case themselves. We need to come together as a people of God and share the love. Because ministry is a hard, hard work. I see it on the face. I see it, you know, I've seen the president when they take office. They're young and they're vibrant. And about after a year or two, they look like old men, don't they? Same thing happens to pastors. Same thing happens to, to, to everyone that's in ministry in the church. So Moses takes the advice and distributes the love. And that's what we need to be doing. Listen. You're a praying bunch of people. I know that. And I appreciate that. And you don't know how many times for each one of us as individuals that you've taken a load off our shoulders. You do that. You do that well. Continue to do that. I encourage you to continue to do that. We live in a hurting world, don't we? We live in a world that is wicked. There's things happening to families. There's things happening in our lives with sickness, with all these things going on. We need to remember that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that are lifting us up, that are praying for us, praying for families, praying for friends, praying for those who are sick. Wake up in the middle of the night. I guess it's part of getting over where they said it is. I wake up in the middle of the night and I'll have somebody on my mind. And I'll begin to pray, and it's amazing. I begin to pray, and, and I'll tell you, I, I'm a person that, I'm not good with names. But you know, I see God time after time after time will bring somebody up to me by name. You need to be praying for them. You need to be praying for this. It is that sweet time of fellowship that's just unbelievable that we can enjoy with God when we lift other people up to Him. And that's our job. That's our job. It's our privilege, but it's our job. So, the next few weeks we're going to be looking at different people that's going to be sharing the same discipleship, the same uh, leadership, and carry the load when we can. Anything else to that? Okay. Pray for Jacob uh, this morning that he prepares to, to preach to us. We are so privileged to have a man who will stand in the pulpit and preach God's word. I'm telling you folks, I've seen them, 
been to churches. They're not like that anymore. They're not like that. So, all right. Anything else before we leave? Everybody have anything? Oh, I'm going to tell you all now. June the 7th is a special day at my house. Yeah. It's my anniversary. Our anniversary. Sorry. <laughs> and it is 55. Everybody tells me, man, Mary Beth should have been good after all these years. She should. She should. Look at me. I'm celebrating 55 years Don't write that down, are you? Please. Let's stand be this this morning. Thank you again for being here. Remember each other this week. Lift up with those. Uh, I did talk to Mary last night. Very good. Told y'all, but remember Bill Rawls. He is he is in high school. And I tell him uh, family that uh, the next uh, two days are going to be very critical for him. So. Pray for Mary, pray for the family, and uh, pray for each other this week. All right. Mr. Bob, would you dismiss us, please? Father, for this day, for this class, for this lesson that we've heard today, thank you and praise you. Lord, we ask you to uh, show us, folks, that we need to decide <coughs> can disciple and give us the ability to speak your will and your your wisdom and your love to all these people that we need to better influence. Thank you for this lesson. We ask you to be with these big people that have been mentioned today who need your love and comfort and healing. And we ask you to go with us now as we go to worship you and plan our week to show the love of you, the love of Christ to everyone we meet. Pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen.